good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving this opportunity to present my work. Um, so uh, I'm going to be presenting on properties of neutralizing antibodies elicited by a HCV vaccine candidate. And um, uh, thanks to Dr. Todd Cox's uh, excellent talk, I don't really need to go too in depth about why we need a vaccine. Um, I would agree that we do need a prophylactic vaccine in addition to all these other measures to reduce incidence to really get control of uh, the disease burden. So the main um, challenge to that has always been like the high diversity of HCV. As you can see, um, there's seven different genotypes with up to a 30 to 40% sequence diversity in the primary amino acid sequence. And even between subtypes within each genotype, there can be up to 15 to 25%. And you can see that these are well distributed across the globe. So the main issue is that while, I mean, of course, uh, ideally you'd have a global vaccine that could prevent against all uh, the different genotypes and subgenotypes, uh, more realistically, you'd have to go for um, at least an effective vaccine, which could uh, protect you from all the um, strains and of diversity that's within your region. So, um, it, rather than the other, uh, the Ochiris vaccine, which is aiming to elicit mostly T cell responses, our vaccine is more interested in eliciting neutralizing antibodies uh, using recombinant E1, E2. And this has previously been demonstrated by uh, Michael Howden colleagues to um, be able to prevent in vivo um, challenge of, uh, in chimpanzees. Uh, so uh, following up on that, uh, there was a phase one clinical trial for safety immunogenicity in healthy human volunteers. And in this, they use a common E1, E2 protein from a single genotype 1A sequence. And this exact same immunogen was also used to immunize two separate goats and, and for our lab just as a way to, uh, to study the response since the human um, samples were in, in short uh, supply. So what we did was we took a panel of um, cell culture derived HCV CC uh, representing different genotypes and we looked to see whether or not they could uh, cross neutralize the, um, the entry of these diverse viruses. And you can see that while it's still quite, um, um, it's only a moderate level of cross neutralization, you can see that uh, genotypes one, uh, four, five, and six are quite well neutralized, where while uh, two and three are quite lacking. But still, since the paradigm was uh, used to exist that um, you would only get isolate specific neutralizing antibodies, this was still a, um, very encouraging. So I'd like to go briefly into HCV entry. It's a very complicated process, but I'll just cover that quickly. So there's initial um, nonspecific binding to um, factors such as heparin sulfate proteoglycans uh, before direct interaction between uh, most uh, E2 and SRB1 and CD81. There's other interactions with cloudin and occludin and that allows for clathin mediated endocytosis and escape from the endosome um, when the low pH is triggered. And for the purpose of this talk, I'm really just gonna be talking about uh, CD81. So uh, the rationale was that uh, investigating vaccine elicited antibodies for one, where they bind on E1, E2, and two, how they block viral entry uh, could prevent, provide insight for vaccine development. So first of all, uh, the first question was where are vaccine elicited an neutralizing antibodies binding to on E1, E2? And I'm just showing the E2 uh, core solved structure. And on this red uh, binding face, uh, or sorry, on this red face, this is approximately the uh, CD81 binding site. And we got five different um, monoclonal antibodies against E2 from uh, different collaborators. And they bind to different regions on this red face to prevent uh, E2-CD81 interaction, and this allows for broad cross-neutralization. So I want to see whether or not vaccine-elicited uh, antibodies had similar epitopes. So I did a competition analysis where I allowed uh, goat antiserum to bind to uh, E1-E2 first before seeing whether or not that precluded the ability for uh, these anti-E2 anti monoclonal antibodies to bind. And you can see while the uh, pre-immune doesn't have uh, um, an effect on the binding of those monoclonals, uh, in all these cases for all five antibodies, the post-immune serum were able to, indicating that they uh, contained antibodies with a similar epitope. 
So then the second question where it was, um, how are vaccine elicited neutralizing antibodies preventing entry of HCV? And to study this, I did a modified version of that, uh, of the, our basic uh, entry uh, neutralization of, uh, of entry experiment. So you can allow virus to bind, uh, I'm sorry, you can allow virus to bind at four degrees for uh, two hours. This allows them to go under the, undergo that initial attachment, but not efficiently enter. At that point, you wash off um, unbound virus and you shift to 37 to allow for entry, but this still takes time. So what you can do is you can add, um, if you have an inhibitor or anti sera or antibody, you can add it at different time points um, to see it, when they start losing effect, because something that affects uh, something quite late in entry is going to keep working whether or not you add it after binding, um, half an hour after that, one, two, or four hours after. Uh, but something that affects um, the er very earliest part of entry is going to lose effectiveness very quickly. And you can see that for um, bifilomycin A1, which blocks um, that um, acidification of the endosome, which allows for for escape at the very late points in entry, you can see that um, it works all the way up to about uh, two hours before leveling out. Uh, however, anti-CD81, which blocks uh, CD81 E2 engagement, uh, acts at a step quite a bit earlier than that. It still works well after, after that initial attachment, uh, but by um, one hour, it's lost effectiveness. Um, and uh, the important thing in this is that the GOAT anti-sera, uh, the E1, E2 vaccine, the GOAT anti-sera, has a very similar kinetics as the anti-CD81 antibody, which really um, uh, parallels what was seen, what I showed you earlier. Uh, so I want to follow up on that and uh, may ensure that uh, the GOAT anti-sera was blocking the binding of E1, E2 to, uh, to CD81. So I did a binding experiment where I took uh, GST tagged CD81, um, captured it on beads, and uh, added recombinant E1, E2 in the presence or absence of vaccine antisera to see how much E1, E2 I could pull down with uh, onto CD81. Um, so you can see that for uh, when, I, when AR3B was present, uh, which is one of those anti-E2 antibodies that should block E2 CD81 interaction, uh, you can see that it, it, does, um, I, it does block um, interaction between E2 and CD81 in my assay, uh, while the B6, which is isotype control, does not. And for the two goats, uh, while the pre-immune antiseroid doesn't have an effect on the interaction between E2 and CD81, uh, there is a dose-dependent um, effect of post-vaccine um, antiseroid on E2 CD81 interaction. So uh, to conclude, immunization with E1, E2 elicits cross-neutralizing antibodies. And uh, likewise, they compete with the binding of other cross-neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. And I've, in this talk, I've shown you particularly that block E2, CD2 and interaction. Um, the vaccine-elicited antibodies had uh, neutralization kinetics similar to a CD81 blocking antibody. And so this could indicate that inhibition is taking um, at an early entry steps prior to or at the CD1 binding step. And uh, I've shown that it uh, can directly block E2 CD2 interaction, but I'm also investigating um, other steps uh, very concurrent to that, um, including uh, E2 SRB1 engagement. Um, and so in summary, immunizing with E1, E2 uh, elicits neutralizing antibodies that likely bind to conserved regions responsible for interacting with receptors involved in earlier parts of entry. And our lab right now is currently developing and testing a second generation vaccine uh, based on E1, E2. And that's scheduled to enter clinical trials by the end of next year. Um, so thank you all for listening. I'd like to thank um, all the collaborators involved, everyone in my lab, and uh, funding. Thank you. <laughs>